uh, paid over 10 billion in taxes. I paid more uh, than anyone in taxes. Uh, but I, you know, I'm glad to have paid. You know, if I'd had to pay 20 billion, it's fine. Uh, but you know, when you say I should pay 100 billion, okay, then I'm starting to do a little math about uh, what I have left over. Sorry, uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, so you really want the incentive system to be there, and you can go a long ways without threatening that. Have you ever talked to Elizabeth Warren about any of this not. before? Would you? Would you want to? You know, I'm not sure how open-minded she is, uh, <laughs> uh, or that she'd even be willing to sit down with somebody you know, who has uh, large amounts of money. That was Bill Gates yesterday at the Deal Book Conference. And uh, after that comment, Elizabeth Warren got on Twitter and she said, I am always happy to meet with people, even if we have different views. Bill Gates, if we get the chance, I'd love to explain exactly how much you'd pay under my wealth tax. I promise it's not $100 billion. Some others have now done the math and it looks like it's closer to $12 billion. It's about $6 billion more than he's paying currently. We want to discuss this and so much more with Pulitzer Prize winning columnist and bestselling author Tom Friedman. So what do you think of this wealth tax? You know, I'm not an expert on health care or whatever, so I've been trying to read uh, right. as many analyses as I had. And the one that made the most sense to me was by Larry Summers yesterday in the Washington Post. I mean, a Democrat, I mean, someone who's predisposed to this. And um, Larry's made a point that a lot of people have made that the whole plan relies on the most optimistic scenarios of where the economy will go for the next 10 years, the money that can in be In terms raised. of both the taxes exactly. and taxes raised and, and also the costs exactly. on, at, on the on the Medicare at, for All plan. At both ends of it, number, right. number one. And, you know, Larry also pointed out that, um, uh, you know, the New Deal and the Great Society, you know, we're all actually based on middle class also paying for all these expansions of, of new programs. So, um, my position, Andrew, I'm, I actually liked Obamacare. I thought right. it was in the right direction. And I think expanding Obamacare by adding a public option that actually would create a government health um, uh, entity that could actually drive down costs because right. it would have far fewer costs than private health insurance companies. Um, and going back to taxing uh, young people to make sure everyone's in the program so you have a balanced pool. Uh, why did we just junk that whole program uh, uh, that Democrats fought for and, and leap to this without saying, why don't we fix and improve that? But if you watch the election in Kentucky, if you draw any conclusion from Bashir's yep. apparent victory, it's that I think people want to, uh, they want to move forward incrementally. Um, they don't want some radical transformation of the economy in ways that we have no so idea. That's going to be my question. Out. You travel a lot, yeah. though. Do you feel like within the Democratic Party, that this is going to, that, that, that Elizabeth Warren is going to win the game here? Andrew, I think the overwhelming political fact in America today is that more than half of Americans feel they don't have a candidate they're excited about to right. vote for in the next election. That includes moderate Republicans, yep. independents, and suburban women, and a lot of, um, uh, I would call, you know, pro-business Democrats uh, like myself. I think there's just a lot of people feel unrepresented, and I don't think that's sustainable. Somebody's going to fill that vacuum. Tom, if, you, if you believe that, that a public option would actually save money and, and spend less, see, mm -hmm. my, my point is the, it, it seems like a, 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 a kind of an obvious narrative. You mm -hmm. don't have to ha earn a profit. Right. You don't have all these other things that private Advertising, all yeah. But then the whole reason that, that the private sector seems more efficient in allocating capital is mm -hmm. because there has to be more, more oversight. You mm -hmm. actually have to watch your P's and Q's. Right. And... If you believe the public option really would be cheaper and save money, then go for it. Go for the whole yeah. thing that way. Mm -hmm. If you really believe that, don't yeah. go piecemeal. Don't just try. And I think we've had some, uh, some, some tests of the public option, uh, whether it's the VA mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Even the, the fraud that we see still perpetrated in, in Medicare. Right. I'm not sure you do. I think the private sector... Yeah. Insurance would win over a public. Right. I don't think you would see that the public option is a better. It's a it's a legitimate um, uh, question, I think, Joe. And I think I wouldn't start uh, with a massive public. I think we need to iterate. We need to experiment. Try it, we'll try it one try more it. time. See if we can get it right well, this time. Maybe get, get the public sector. That yeah, they won't maybe. be the DMV of healthcare. Maybe. Let's just see. I think it's worth experimenting. You know, there are a lot of experiments in Obamacare that have not around cost controls also that were not implemented. Tom, but I just want to go back to uh, you said you thought someone had there would fill this void, this middle ground. And I'm just sitting around, looking around, going, who? Who is that person? Unless, unless you think Elizabeth Warren is going to pivot 
when she's which I clinches, wonder about. But well, yeah. when she clinches or, nomination, or, or, be, or be unable to do anything that she really wants to do. That's yeah, I've right. so many yeah. Democrats tell me that. Oh, she'll be. She won't. Oh, by the way, that, right, Hillary, exactly. Clinton, Hillary Clinton said that to me last night. She said, you know, she can get in there. And, and say, hey, I've heard you. I've heard and, the criticism. And, and it's, not, and it's yeah. just not going to happen because it's not, it's not practical. Like Valerie the, Jarrett said the same kind of yeah, thing, yeah, by the yeah. way. Like the wall? These, well, I mean, she's, maybe she's, like, she's like Mexico clearly, paying for the wall. You know, let, let me, uh, to your point, but let, me, let me give you a, a, what may seem like a strange analogy. But um, uh, So I watched the Israeli-Palestinian conflict very closely because I found that over time it is to the wider uh, trends in civilization what off-Broadway is to Broadway. Okay? You see things in miniature there. So I'm always asking, what's playing off Broadway? You know, airline hijacking scale there, suicide bombing scale there, a wall started there. A lot of things start there and go to Broadway. So what, what's just been playing off Broadway? Um, they just had two elections in about six months. Um, and the last one was very revelatory, I believe. Number one, Netanyahu ran an openly racist, divisive campaign against Israeli Arabs. And Israeli Arabs in the second election said, uh, oh, you talking to me? And they went out and voted in record numbers and created the third largest party in Israel, number one. Number two, Netanyahu was everywhere, on Twitter, on Facebook, every, he was there all the time. His opponent, Benny Gantz, people were putting a mirror under his nose saying, Benny, are you breathing? E Bibi's eating you alive on Facebook and Twitter. And turned out Israelis got sick of it. And actually 250,000 Israelis changed their vote between the first election and the second. Third thing that happened, Netanyahu ran this divisive. Be, uh, uh, ben, Benny Gantz, his opponent, ran on national unity. I'm not going to offer you the peace process now, folks. I'm not going to offer some radical plan. I just want to pull the country together. So I find it, as a distant mirror, very interesting what's been playing off Broadway. And therefore, I think someone comes with a very simple message. I want to pull the country together. Right. I want to improve health care. I want to work on, on Obamacare. Um, and I want to focus on education. It's a little bit what Bashir was doing down there in Kentucky. I think, I think that person could do very well. But, but pop out a name. Buttigieg. You think Buttigieg could? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think he's, he's someone who's... I tell you, I, I like the way he talks, Andrew, in this way. I like the way he talks about faith. I like the way he talks about his faith. I like the way he talks about abortion. There is a sensitivity to him that, uh, uh, and, a, and an intelligence that I find very, I don't know him, never met him, right. uh, but I find very compelling. You know, there's a lot of America that says grace every evening. And I think we should remember that. And, and, as, uh, and sometimes liberals forget that. And I think he's someone who in time, um, I think, could catch on. So yes, saying, he's young. You're saying in time. That's yeah, the thing. And, I, and I don't know, John, but I'm saying that. Top of the ticket? Um, don't know. And I, I, I know all the liabilities, but look, we just had an African-American president and Donald Trump. The liabilities. I, mean, I, think. The other, I mean, he's got far fewer than. We broke all the molds as yeah. far as I'm concerned. The one and only Tom Friedman. Thank you.